Welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. This is episode number 119, and I was uh, reached out to by John Dennis, who is a, a music ed professor at Texas State University, as well as a longtime band director in Texas and grew up there as well. And he has a fabulous podcast for band directors, which if you have not subscribed to and checked out, you should do that. It's called Program Notes. And he also has a great book through GIA called Program Notes, a comprehensive guide to band directing. Uh, in this conversation, this is a, a split podcast, so we're going to be um, putting it out on his podcast as well as here on the Growing Band Director podcast, which by the way, if you have not actually clicked that subscribe button, it would be great if you did for us, podcasting platform and on YouTube. Uh, in this conversation, we talk about so many great things, including lifelong learning, teaching in less than ideal schedules, uh, rehearsal priorities and strategies, tips to rehearsing, a ballad with a young band, there it is, um, music to use for babies when you want to raise good musicians, and that's just in the first 15 minutes. So um, it's, it's a great conversation. He's a, a great hang, and I hope you check out his podcast as well as continue to uh, support this one as well. So I hope you enjoy this great conversation. Here's John Dennis and I uh, just a couple days ago. I do want to say thank you because I know I, I just kind of cold emailed you or you Facebook message you or I'm a date myself. <laughs> not that much older than you, but that's <laughs> no, all good. I'm 44. I'm okay, so I'm not older than you at all. We're the same. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so dating myself and doing it that way, but I don't know, whenever I see somebody doing something cool and I have time in my schedule to try to reach out and, mm -hmm. and share that I try to do so. And, you know, they don't let me out of my state borders very often. <laughs> so <laughs> It's always cool when I run across something and I'm like, oh, that's in a different part of the country. That's How right. exciting is that? That's right. You know, um, so why don't you just kind of, and I know we're swapping this, but let's both just introduce ourselves. But I'd like you to go first, just okay. to give anybody who's not familiar with Kyle Smith an idea of who Kyle is. Yeah, so I'm a band director up in Maine. My wife and I have been teaching at uh, the same district um, where it's a two person, well, it's three person, but she's been doing middle school four years and I do the high school for four years since 2006. Um, been teaching for 20 years now and I teach in Westbrook High School. Um, do kind of everything there. I have a wonderful team who I work with, but we do a little bit of everything that you can imagine when it comes to band. Um, and then a, a few years ago, a friend and I, Jeff, um, friend of mine, Jeff and I started uh, the Growing Band Director podcast. Um, you know, again, just looking to share ideas and you were just mentioning off air too, John, that like we were talking about something relating to our program. And I said, you know what? The amount of people who would love to hear that conversation, because we're just going back and forth about things we know as experienced teachers. And Jeff's even far more experienced than I am. But I said, you know, we should start recording that. So we've done, I think for me, this will be at episode 119 or 20 that, that we're on now. And, uh, you know, it's most of it is with guests, but I try to do it with everything you can imagine when it comes to band, whether it's parents or tech stuff or a lot of repertoire things jazz band concert band marching band middle school beginning band high school kind of try to hit around everything um in kind of a weekly format so i'm not really into the theoretical talking about teaching sort of thing i'm into the i'm literally driving to school right now please give me a tip to improve the clarinet intonation you know things like that so that's what i try to bring no i think that's i think that's phenomenal that's that's what i love and then what i try to live and breathe as much mm -hmm. as i possibly can um, you know, this is year 19 for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I transitioned to doing the higher ed thing a number of years ago at this point, I'm trying to think, yeah, it's almost, it's almost 10 years ago now, not quite, mm -hmm. um, that I, I moved on to higher ed. So, uh, for your listeners out there, uh, I'm John Dennis and I was a band director in Texas for a number of years. I've only worked in Texas. I've worked at a rural school. Uh, quasi rural school, worked at a suburban school, and I've worked at a low income school before transitioning to do uh, higher ed. And now I head up uh, one of the larger music ed programs in the state of Texas and do clinics, uh, doing a presentation in Midwest on beginning woodwind pedagogy uh, mm -hmm. this year, which I'm really excited about, uh, and write things and just try to find ways to help young teachers specifically for to sure. be successful because uh anybody who ever runs across anybody i worked with in the first two years of my career is going to be like that dude didn't know what he was doing which is nope. at a fair assessment because i did not well and it's funny you know you're teaching college now like no matter how amazing the college is 
you can't take for, for, you know, eight semesters and like learn everything you need to know. I mean, heck people teach for 40 years and they realize they don't need, they don't know what they need to know. So it's yeah. that, that willingness to, to learn constantly. And I think the podcast forum is wonderful for that because you can search by topic, you can search by person, you can search by whatever, you can go back and listen to it four years later. I mean, it's just like on demand, free learning. Mm -hmm. No, and I, I absolutely agree. And it's, it's funny you say that because, you know, at, at the college level, the big triage is what are the, what are the most important things? What are the things that we can learn in the moment uh, and actually leave being able to know? And that's, that's a never ending question. I thought, you know, do this long enough, you'll at least be able to do that, right? I still, yeah. every time I go clinic a band, I'm still learning and I'm still applying new things mm -hmm. or I go to a, a state or national clinic like Midwest. I'm still learning things. I'm still getting new tricks that I can use, right? But I'm like, mm -hmm. but I'll, I'll know the basics by now, right? <laughs> no, we're, <laughs> we're always still refining and still working and still tweaking. And I'm still learning things and adding things to my to my toolbox. And I'm sure uh, there's stuff you say that you say in the show and, or people will, you know, experienced teachers will hear something and it's not that it's new information for them, but it reminds them of something that maybe they used to do, or they go, you know what, it is important that I still do that. So, you know, I, a lot of people will say, well, I want to share on your podcast, but everybody knows what I know. And it's like, yeah, no, <laughs> it's not the case, you know, no. share. And even it's like having somebody out to work with your students and they say the same thing you've said, yeah. but in a slightly different way. And the students go, Oh yeah. And you're like, didn't, didn't we talk about that yesterday? <laughs> Wasn't oh, that something? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I have, I have to admit some curiosity for my part, because, you know, I spent a lot of time working with uh, how to teach beginners, but beginners in Texas are a very unique experience. It's yeah. not, it's not something that's very common in other places because we have classes. They're just dedicated to an instrument. So when you right. start, you'll start in a flute class or in a trumpet class, mm -hmm. right? And so, I mean, I have other things and other curiosities, but I really love the perspective of like, how do you build those those individual instrument pedagogy skills well in a situation where you don't have the spot, the time or the option or the, the finances because it costs mm -hmm. a lot of money to hire an extra teacher to, to drill in and have those, those sectionals when they're older or those beginner times when yeah. they're younger that are just on that one instrument. I almost wish I could, I have prepared for that. Cause I just call my wife in from the other room and she'll like tell you all the things. <laughs> um, cause she's the master teacher, but to me, you know, there is no substitute for it really, you know? And I think in some situations they can get a little bit of money for contracted services and then bring in some people and then split out into different practice rooms and do your sectionals and things that way. You know, there, there is nothing like having a scheduled sectional time. I mean, that's really it. And then you know, and I think some studies have been done some, at least around here in Maine, where I teach, most people start in fifth grade, some start in fourth, I don't think anybody starts in sixth. But by the time they get to the end of the sixth grade, I feel like they're all kind of in the same spot. Uh, anyway, so what each town does is kind of obviously up to them. Um, but yeah, that it's such a big deal, you know, and, and getting the time with the kids. I mean, there's nothing more important than that, that money's nothing. It's the time that you need with the kids and obviously, you know, money to bring people in and all that. So I don't know if I have a great answer, to be honest with you. I mean, it's really important. And I think creative teachers find a lot of different ways to do that. You know, maybe they build warm ups where they're, you know, they're all doing what they need to do within the warm up. Um, but it's definitely not as ideal. Well, how about then just in, in your, in your high school rehearsal setting, what are you able to do? How often do you meet? What do you, what yep. do you think are kind of your, your big things of like, oh, these are the things I do to, to help yep. my students improve. So we meet every other day, 70 minutes, typical AB schedule kind of thing. When I have Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, the Wednesday, we have a sectional where I'll have four professional teachers come in and we break off. So we have like four rehearsals and one sectional every two weeks. Um, for me, it's tone followed by tone, followed by tone, followed by tone, and maybe some musicality in there. Um, you know, but again, we're all juggling as band directors, right? So like you might go, wow, the tone is great. They can't tongue worth a lick, you know? Okay, now we're going to work on tonguing man, they can't do lip slurs and they get tired in 10 minutes. Now we're going to start doing that. So people have to just know that you can't do everything. You just can't. So if you're aware of what your kids can't do, you're probably doing a pretty good job. Well, I love the idea of like, you've got to, you've got to build a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, so when I work with the, the college students, I call this kind of the hierarchy of listening. Whenever I walk into an ensemble that I'm working with, there there's 
a clear hierarchy I have in my head of these are the things that matter to me most, of which tone is number one, no question. Um, that if I hear a problem there, it's like, okay, I'm going to ignore the rest of this for a minute and we're going to try to do that. Now I'm being brought in to help out with little things here and there. Sure. It's not the same anymore as when I was teaching. Some, somebody's and, done the real work already, yeah. right? Yeah. But you better believe when I was teaching, it was still the same thing, mm -hmm. much to some of my students' chagrin. Mm -hmm. Like, do we, can we move on from tone that long tones, ellipsers and balance and blend and intonation now? No, <laughs> no, we mm -hmm. cannot. Yeah. And I find that like, yeah, I'd sit there and work on ballads and long tones all day, but I, I met with Peter Boonshaft recently and it's like, he said something like your number one job is to have a band, right? So I think the master teacher can do all of those important things, but also make the kids love the entire experience, whether or not it's because of how you're programming or how you act or that you run around the room or like whatever it is, you know, th I think a lot of times kids are sold on you. I mean, they love music, but you're the one who's going to sell them on if they stay in the program or not. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's like with jobs, right? The old saying is people quit bosses more than they quit the the duties. Mm -hmm. You know, people mm -hmm. quit. People quit band directors quite often. Mm -hmm. People remember the bad teachers, right? You know, it was funny. We were talking about um, tone and things like I was just working on a Carol Britton Chambers tune with I have a our second band is really bad at ballads right now. It's just and if anybody in that band is listening, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't mean to put you down. But <laughs> um, they're just it's something they struggle with because quite honestly, they don't count. They know how to count. But they you know, you can tell when you listen to a band, are they literally going one, two, three, four in their head? Or are they not going one, two, three, four in their head? Um, so they struggle with it. Um, and I took an eight bar passage and I said, you know what, today they're going to sound great on this passage. And again, it's grade one and a half. So there's nothing in there that's quote unquote challenging, but I didn't work on the notes and the rhythms at all. First I'd said, okay, let's, um, clap the rhythms. So it was literally just getting the rhythms kind of in place. And then I said, let's bop it for people who don't use that language. That's where you take every note and just play it as a short note on the downbeat or wherever it starts. Um, then we played it again and I said, Okay, see all the phrase marks? I had them like draw the phrase mark in, their, in, in the air, right? Okay, so now decide where you want to breathe. Take a minute, talk to people around you, figure out where your breath points are. Okay, great. Now we'll do that again. Now what I want you to do is every note and measure gets louder or softer. Do something. And then we did it like three or four times. And then all of a sudden, like the music is coming alive, right? And I never had to work on whatever, but I found that if I can access them, I guess like their own individuality and their personality and their humanity, through that music that they love it and then the music just starts coming alive and i never talked about hold that three beats don't breathe here i kind of let them own it i don't know if that's the flipped classroom or something else but it seemed to work <laughs> no but it's, it's giving them it's giving them the chance to kind of you know be musicians mm -hmm. not that there isn't anything wrong with breaking things down at times like you know i another thing i love doing in that situation is make them make them subdivide so everything becomes uh, legato subdivisions of whatever the pulse is Mm -hmm. so that we can make sure we're actually paying attention to that pulse and not just trying to guess based on the people on either side of us when they move, right? What's so happening if, in those smooth so if, parts. So if, if someone hasn't heard of that before, like what, what can you explain what that is? Yeah. So like, you know, you're doing a chorale, it's got, you know, half notes, uh, quarter notes, you know, it's something smoother or, or even better when it's like longer, whole notes are longer. And it's it's in you know simple meter that you're 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 having them articulate as smooth and as cleanly as possible the eighth note pulse right da 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 you know I mean mm -hmm. that's not a corral obviously that's an interval mm -hmm. exercise but it's the same idea right to get them to internalize uh, the pulse uh, I had a conversation with the um, conductor at the University of Texas a, lot of, a couple of years ago a few years ago yeah um, we we were we were just talking about how ridiculous it is sometimes where uh, when people when conductors stand up and they the band is dragging and rushing and they start conducting harder mm -hmm. um, and he was like look the, at the end of the day the pulse comes from the ensemble if they don't have internalized the pulse then they're not like nothing you do in on stage is going to solve that problem mm -hmm. instantaneously and it's like okay well then what do we do to get them to internalize the pulse well we can we can turn it into something they do musically and then we can go back and forth. And that's really, I think for me, that's one of the big things is that we want to find ways to mix between the expressivity and just the, the doing that they, they have to be in there and they have to flail around and they have to try and they have to be musicians. Mm -hmm. And if we don't give them the opportunity to do that, 
that level of expressivity is never going to happen. And, you know, I know for, for any listeners who may be aware of kind of the, 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 the super rigid Texas model, which is not everybody in Texas, but mm-hmm. there are certain ensembles that do that. Um, that's, that's where they get into trouble with that is they do amazing, amazing music teaching, amazing instrument pedagogy. And then they never let that last step happen where, where the students have the chance to make an expressive decision or make an expressive mistake as if there mm-hmm. is any such thing as sure. expressing music wrong, <laughs> you know? And so it's like, that's that last step that makes particularly things like chorales. I'm thinking about like my favorite example of this is October. Like mm-hmm. that piece, if you don't get to that step, it's really boring to listen to. Yep, for sure. <laughs> you know, and so it's so it's like it's it's a balanced thing. And where you are in your career and where the students are, that's gonna make a big difference in which you know, are, do you need to get everybody with on the same page of no, nope, that's a rest, we don't plan rests. <laughs> or is it an opportunity to say, okay, but let's where's this going? This music has to be going or coming from somewhere. Where is mm-hmm. it going? Where is it coming from? You tell me. Don't let me tell you. Let's figure it out. <laughs> yeah, and there's times when I'll work on the expressivity of a piece when they're missing notes and rhythm still. But when you work on that, it's funny how sometimes those other things, because, you know, Terry White, one of my friends, says this, like, kids want to play. They don't want to hear you talk. Now, you need to talk, but they want to play. So he says sometimes if you just do it again, so much, so many of the things you would fix actually get fixed. Mm-hmm. So it's funny. Sometimes I'll say, we're going to take another shot at that. You know, I don't like to just repeat to repeat, but there is some of that. If you're a younger teacher and you don't know what to say, sometimes having them play it again is helpful. I'll also say um, an exercise I do to get them to work on the crescendo state crescendos is we just say one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, over and over again, but slowly. And then I let them just choose any dynamics they want. And they start screaming like one, two, three, four, one, two, and they just mix it. And they said, okay, now you have to just gradually do it. And then that turns into how can we crescendo and decrescendo. And what I love is that they can do whatever they want. It's almost like if you have a kid who's, say it's a grade two band and you're just trying to get them to place with expression somehow, right? It's almost like if they do anything that doesn't go over the top, it sounds good. It's like they're just going with their own human emotions. And we forget that these little robots that we teach like have big time emotions and honestly they have almost as many emotions as we do or more but they're just type they're like held up in these little bodies so if you can find a way to naturally cultivate that obviously they'll pay attention more and they'll sit still a little more but they'll also come up with some good music oh yeah another fun thing to do is to give uh, a particular section the uh dynamic like reins hey uh second clarinets are going to be our dynamic drivers. And if they get louder or softer, you can't make that adjustment until you hear from them and then flip it around to another one. That's great also because then you get to do kill two birds with one stone. You get to do uh, dynamic contrast and you also get to practice balancing to the melody because you assigned to, to somebody and then later on in your music, you can be like, hey, interestingly enough, second clarinets have the melody right here. We should make sure we can hear them. Yeah. I have a question for you. Uh-huh. Um, so I'll, I'll, I don't want to, I'll say my thought first. Like there's a lot of people who think, at least in the philosophical way of music education, that every kid has a steady beat. You have a heartbeat. They know how to walk. Every kid can keep steady beat. I, I have found in my 20 years of teaching that is absolutely not true. Um, I don't know if you agree with that or disagree. Uh, from an educational psychological standpoint, yeah, not true is definitely the research E answer. <laughs> Okay. (laughs) Um, So, so like it's a skill, right? And skills are learned. Um, So can the, the real question is, can you teach it to the student? Mm -hmm. Not do they come naturally with it? Now that's not to say the students don't come with musical things naturally, because, you know, I say naturally they come with musical things because they heard music before they came into our classroom, no matter what age they are. Mm -hmm. And so they've been exposed to music before, which means they come with, they're not a blank slate musically. They come with some kind of musical tradition and musical enculturation Mm -hmm. that goes in their ear. This is a large part at the higher ed level where I spend a lot of my time is how do we, how do we teach and learn? And so how can we make it easier for young teachers to do it well? And we get into this, this issue when we work with people whose musical cultures are different. They may be 
in a culture for which rhythm is a big and pulse is a big part of this, right? If you get into world music, you can find a lot of really interesting, like Ghana and West African uh, drumming. Mm-hmm. It's like super insane in how rhythmic, rhythmically complex it is. And those people who are cultured in that, they're more likely to have a beat. But you're dealing with a vast majority of a wide variety of people who listen to a whole bunch of different music and whose parents listen to different music and who may have it playing or not. So you're coming in a wide different wide different range of students coming into you. So then what do you do? That's what we do. Good teaching mm-hmm. is that which brings about learning. Like that's what it is as far as I'm concerned. Mm-hmm. You know, bad teaching is you, you do something and nobody gets better. <laughs> and so when it comes to Pulse, can you teach them? You know, not did they, were they born with it? Are they born with the ability to learn? Sure. Yep. But it's learned. And, and it's funny. We, uh, a couple of things I had that I thought that you were talking about that one is, I don't know if people know this, but like the kid's heartbeat, obviously the younger they are, the faster their heartbeat is. And as you get older, it gets slower. That's why they're so bad at playing slow tempos. Cause if your heartbeat is going at 120 all the time and you ask them to play at 80, they're going to struggle. But as they get older, the ballads become easier. So it's really not, I mean, there's like science behind why mm-hmm. young kids struggle with, with slow tempo specifically. Yeah. And they also uh, prefer it in the research. So when they do, when they do research about, do they prefer it or not, the younger they are, the more they prefer tempos around 110. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And that's also why I think we tend to subdivide too. Like if the tempo gets too fast, we don't like to think about 300 beats a minute. We'll think about 150 and cut time. Right. Because it's closer to where our our natural rhythms are. The other thing I was thinking of, of, you're talking about kids being brought up in music and uh, what they listen to, what they don't. I remember we have my wife and I have two kids. They're now in fourth grade and seventh grade. Um, No, no shock. They're both good musicians. Um, But when they were when my daughter was born, we we bought like six CDs of books a million. Like, all right, we're going to listen to kids music. We literally threw every single one of them away. It's like we heard half of the first track and you're like, the kids are screaming. They're not even singing the right notes. Like, why would we listen to this? So we threw it away and we were on a mission. So then she said, you know, I was I was taught by John Feyerabend, you know, the conversational solfege method with and there's all these recordings. They're all on Apple Music and everything with Jill Trinka and John Feyerabend and all of these things. And we listened and it was amazing. And I swear, if if anybody's looking for music for young kids, get those CDs or whatever. Literally, that's all my kids listen to for the first five years of their life. And by the time they're two and a half, they're singing and matching pitch, like no problem. It's it's just amazing. So like what your kids listen to as a parent actually will determine a lot of their success in the future. And that matters as band directors too. Do we actually have them listen to a diet of reasonable uh, proximities of their instrument? Mm-hmm. Like one of my colleagues here really is into this idea of ideal aural images of you have to, your students should have an idea of what their instrument actually is supposed to sound like. Right. And um, I mean, that's something I had done for years, but I'd never really thought about making it a, a systematic thing. I, I did where it's like, here's our library, here's our listening assignments. Everybody's got to go listen to these three people, you know? And when I got a chance to hear that from my colleague, I was like, why didn't I ever think about that? Because mm-hmm. We can we can dance about the architecture that is talking about tone quality, or I can be like, "Hey, you're trombonist. You should sound like Joe Alessi, <laughs> right?" Mm-hmm. And are they going to get there right away? Of course not. But if that's their goal, I could do a whole lot worse than that with with my students. And that's why you know it's funny. Um, um, who's his name? Phil Snedeker, famous trumpet teacher, came into my band room once doing a lesson with a kid. He doesn't live in the area. It was a guest thing, and he looked at me and he said you must be a really good teacher. And I was like, whoa, that, thank you. That's, that's a great compliment coming from you. I appreciate it. Why do you say that? You've never seen me even talk to a kid. She said, he said, your trumpet's right next to the podium. He's like, you probably play for your students a lot. I was like, yeah, I play all the time. He's like, you're demonstrating. Now, you know, I can't demonstrate a professional sound on every instrument. Um, and I think I'm better at getting my kids to demonstrate a, the profession, a better band sound because we can listen to pieces. Um, I don't listen to as many, as much solo repertoire, at least in class. I know you mentioned having them do it as listening assignments and all that and getting kids hooked on that is really huge, but I would like a better way to get more of my kids listening. Cause you're right. I probably have young students who don't have a model for what they want to sound like. You have ensemble models that you like to point them towards. Um, specific groups. No, I mean, we all have like the standard ones that we've known and, and loved, but usually it's more specific recordings. You know, if we're doing a certain piece, 
we might go towards this recording or, or that recording. So, I mean, but hearing the live on Osaka album with the Bach um, was the Takata and Fugue in D minor. It's like, I mean, give me a break. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's like not, not right. It was funny. I was at university of uh, North Texas in 2010 with my wife doing the collegium that mm -hmm. what, 13 years ago or so. And I was the, the stupid guy that got there. Of course I, we brought tennis rackets in June in texas to texas well <laughs> where we're from it's tennis weather like clearly we didn't use those tennis rackets but uh i wore like my white cool shirt because like i was dying right so then i get up there in front of corporon alan mcmurray and dennis fisher wearing mm -hmm. a white shirt conducting with a white baton and of course the first thing they say is hey see this guy never do that <laughs> and it was it was such a great opportunity i forget what i was where i was going with it but uh that, oh, somebody said, how do I get my band to sound like yours? And, and Corporon's like, don't, we don't sound like that. We, it's all edited. Like we sound amazing, but we don't even sound like that recording. So don't try to get your band to sound like us because it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. well, I'm glad you got to do it. That's such a cool event. That's why I did my uh, master's and doctorate. Yeah. Um, and it's such a cool thing they do for people. And man, you can get a lot out of that. It doesn't have to just be there. That's just the, where I'm more familiar with. You know, mm -hmm. having, having gotten two degrees from that institution. What, what I love about the way they did that is, at least from my understanding, we all got to conduct a piece if you chose that track or you were just there participating. And then when we left, the UNT Wind Symphony would record for a weekend or whatever. And then those CDs were the teaching music through performance and band CDs that everybody has come to know and love. That is correct. So, you know, and also, you know, not not entirely fair because that is almost enti almost entirely graduate students right and so like you know it's a great representation but that's another thing that's interesting because like you know i i'm not i'm not in the conducting space like i'm a music ed professor and we we spend all our time talking about how we can teach classroom stuff better mm -hmm. but i know sometimes when i talk about music recording sometimes conductors not here at my institution but when i mention it to other places they're like oh you got to be careful because you get too locked in get too locked into to making those interpretive mm -hmm. choices. And I totally get where they're coming from. But like when I'm working with the teachers oh, who's in their first year, I'm like, if if you're confused, listen to a recording, get something in your ear, have an ideal image that will help you. Because it's, it's overwhelming. Error detection is so overwhelming for the podium, mm -hmm. I feel like, you know. Um, and that's something like I still work on, I feel like. I, I mean, I'm better than I was 20 years ago. But sure. like can still always be better at that. There's a book I want to tell, tell you about. I got to look it up real quick, though. Hold on a second. No um, worries. Uh, shoot. I thought you were going to talk for like another second. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and hold on. I have absolutely no help. A, I understand. It, That's, a, I've been told that a lot. OK, I got it. It's, <laughs> it's through it's through Chos and I, he's going to hate me for doing it. Actually, one of my best friends is Andy Boysen. And um, so he did. Uh, a book a couple of years ago called Rehearsal Techniques Through Active Listening through Chose, or sorry, Developing Rehearsal Techniques Through Active Listening. The fact that I had to look that up means I'm a bad friend. Um, but it, in any way, what he does is he had a lot of people around the country, very respected teachers at all levels, listen to these recordings of bands at like sight reading and then grades at like 75%. And then they wrote down what they would fix if they were clinicking that band. And then he sort of took that all into a uh, into a spreadsheet and all that. So then now people can, in addition to the book, they can see the score, they can listen to the beginning recording and then the later on recording, right? And choose, would you fix this or this or this or this? And then you can see, oh, Timothy Marr and Jack Stamp and whoever else that people know, like they would have gone after this, you know, and it's a really great way to, you mentioned error detection. It's a, a really new method that people are finding a lot of success with. I think it's fantastic. For, for the last six years, I've taken my old contest recordings and my old judges sheets and we've done a similar thing with our classes mm -hmm. so i make them listen to it try to find their errors and then i make them compare what they found versus what the actual judges found in that situation but this mm -hmm. would be even better it's taken it to another level um and i i think it's i think it's wonderful it does speak to planning though if you don't know your own score how are you going to even be able to start that process right right and and that's hard especially if you have multiple ensembles and Lots of pieces. Lots of people are planning. Like we're working on twenty pieces. It's like, you know, finding time. I have a great, mm -hmm. a great friend Trey Blanca who's at Butler University now. He's like, I left high school teaching because I didn't have the time to plan scores. Like I was spending all my time doing everything else. He's like, I need to be able to like spend time musically. Um, and for him, that was right. Um, can I go back to something you said a little while ago? Yeah. 
Um, you sort of were mentioning, um, you know, we try to uncover the secret to great teaching and like what makes great teachers and all that. But so I definitely do not have the answer to that. Um, I would be much richer if I did. Um, but I have come across, you know, I did a music ed podcast with, um, what was it called? The music ed podcast, I guess with Alan Fire um, and Steve, Steve Shanley. And they sort of asked me to boil down, like, what have you learned from over a hundred episodes of like meeting with people and all these master teachers? Um, and I sort of, I said, well, I had to think about that for a little while. And then I realized everything that they talked about kind of was put into three categories. So um, w one would be, you know, programming really amazing music for your kids, you know, not always Holst and Von Williams, but like amazing music that's appropriate and a good level for your kids. Another one is your personal relationships with people that, and then the final one was striving for mastery, like getting really good at all the things, whether that's not accepting bad intonation or bad tone or whatever, but those three things, everything kind of can be put, be put it, put into that, that I've learned so far. Um, and Alan said it in a really good way. He said, you're, you're right. If people have great music and they strive for mastery, but their relationships aren't with the people aren't very good, it's probably not where you want to be, or you have great relationships and you strive for mastery, but you're playing, you know, whatever Jimmy Buffett all the time. Like that's, that's a different story too. So, um, you know, it's not that those are keys in any way, but the, you know, those are really things for people to think about. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I would add probably one, I think. Okay. Uh, and, and I would I would add that you are you are delivering information in a thoughtful and clear way. Because there's there's a lot of there's a lot of data about uh, feedback in music and outside of music and how how important that that process is of getting feedback in the back and forth between teacher and student about that. Mm -hmm. um, that, I mean, one could probably say that falls under developing mastery, but yeah, I would put it in a separate category because it's a set of, a discrete skill. You can know what mastery is in that music situation, but if you can't communicate that mm -hmm. in an effective way, then you, your, your teaching isn't, your students are not going to have the growth that you would want them to. And the, the best teachers, both in my observation and also when, when researchers go out and look at it, the best teachers, they have certain things in how they communicate. Like you were talking earlier about, look, they're not up there to listen. They didn't sign up for band to listen to this talk, right? One of my mentors said, talk less, play more. And mm -hmm. would just say that to me over and over and over again, right? Um, that can you say what you need to say in 10 seconds and then give them the chance to do it again? Or do you need to say anything at all? Can you communicate it non-verbally, right? That, that, that effective communication is is the teaching skill. We have the music skill of, you know, being able to study the score, listen, know what mastery is, know what the, the what you know, we kind of call content knowledge, right? No, is it this finger or this finger? Is it first finger, mm -hmm. second finger, or which key are we in, right? That kind of knowledge. But then how do I communicate that to the students in a way that they understand? And that changes all the time based on where you are, who your students are over time. I imagine you've seen differences in how effective approaches, different approaches to communicating are your students from 2006 to this year. Mm -hmm. And so like, so I would, I would add in there as a, a, not, this isn't just like me being smart. Cause I'm not smart. I just steal from people. Mm -hmm. um, I try to give them credit when I can, yep. <laughs> but but this is talking to other people and watching other teachers. And when, when somebody comes in and does something in a group that just blows everybody's mind, it's usually not the content. It's usually how they communicated it. So it's funny. Like, yeah, the, the more you understand where your students are coming from, you can then deliver that knowledge better. Phil mm -hmm. Edelman, who's a, um, a great teacher and he teaches at university of Maine. Um, one of the things he said when I was meeting with him, he said, I have, I give a percussionist the responsibility and I forget his number. It might've been 10 seconds, seven seconds, 15 seconds, something like that. But he said, when I start talking, if I go past that, you put your drumsticks directly up in the air behind. And that's my symbol, my signal that I'm talking too much. Yeah. I mean, the rule for me is 10 seconds. And I had, I had a, a pretty challenging uh, classroom management year uh, several years ago when I, when I transitioned to that lower income school. And uh, I transitioned to that school like a week before school started because all wow. of their staff quit. I was working elsewhere in the district and they were like, we need somebody over there right now. Let's get somebody over there right now. And it was really two weeks before, but it was within 
in Texas, there's a legal window where you're supposed to have all your teachers locked down. And we were well within that, which is part of the reason why they moved me over because it's a little more challenging to hire outside the district. And so they didn't know they were getting a new director. Um, they they only played and rehearsed. They met every day, but they only rehearsed four of those days. And the fifth and every Friday they watch movies. Mm-hmm. Um, and like so, it was very different culture shock for them for me to come in and, and do all that. But it really forced me to lock this down. And so now every year when we talk about feedback and running rehearsals, I make my students like record me and time me. You know, and watch me, and I'm like, okay, if I go on, if I say more than three things. Or if I say the, for longer than 10 seconds, it's a similar situation. It's mm-hmm. like, call me out on it right now. Let me see if I can get through this 15-minute rehearsal block that y'all are all going to have to do um, without doing that. And because it, it's – Mary Ellen Cavett's dissertation um, uh, was on effective rehearsals, both from the perception of the students and also their improvement in how they play. And what she found was the shorter the talk, the more back and forth, the higher the scores of the students on both metrics, mm-hmm. right? So they also like the rehearsal better. No big shocker, they're playing more. You're talking less, right? right? We may think we're really funny, and that's why we get the um, what's the guy who does the comics, the 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 tone death or whatever comics, um, the band director comic guy. I I just lost his I don't name, know. but there there's there's I see him on social media all the time. The, the like, and it's got the crotchety old band directors and the different like little cartoon characters, comic characters, whatever. Um, the reason why the stereotype of all the lame jokes is because the students think most of our jokes are lame. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, so it's like, I don't know. It's interesting. And, and, and I love that somebody's got an actual responsibility to flag it down and call it out because, yep. you know, like if I were a young teacher out there, I would be taking, taking that to task. I said, I, I did the, like a little timer thing on my stands, how I train myself. Granted, it helped that my classroom management problems were were giving me great motivation not to talk too much. Mm-hmm. But I would hit my stopwatch uh, app on the phone and then would would try to glance at it. Oh, that's too long. Start over again. And the next feedback, try to get it. Because it's it's hard to get that small of a chunk. And the, the pacing is so important. If you have really good pacing, pacing and you get the kids to sound really good quickly, they they buy in pretty when you're trying to build a culture in a program. If you're pacing, like they have to pay attention to keep up or they're going to fall behind and you get them to sound good. It's like, man, then you go to that first concert and the parents go, oh, my gosh, like we've never sounded this good. And they realize that you're the difference. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's a good way to hook people. Yeah. One of the things that you mentioned, I'm curious, it spurs the thought for me. Um, You were talking about kind of the pillar of repertoire. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious, how do you go about like what is your process for for selecting tunes for your ensembles? Yeah. Man, it's hard. So I, I have a running list. And then usually when I do a concert, like that night, the next day or that week, I plan that exact same concert a year ahead of time. With kind of thoughts of who's in the band, who's not in the band, who's coming up, who's not, whatever. Um, so then I kind of have the next year plan no matter when we are. So we might be finishing December concert, but I have all of the next year planned already. Um, and to me, Having that is huge because what I put down, I really like, and I think will work right now, but then I could, I would rather tweak a program than have to come up with a brand new program. Now I've had programs that, okay, here's the four pieces we're going to do or three or two or five or whatever it is that you, that concert. And then literally by the time we get there, they're all different, but it doesn't matter because, you know, I've had a thoughtful approach to that. It's almost like when people are drafting a player, you know, it's like, okay, we're going to take the second baseman. Well, who are they going to replace? Like they have to be better than something we have. So I might go, I love Rosa Medjer right now, but I'm doing this and that can't, this is better for us right now. Right. So, uh, you know, listening to a lot of music and planning ahead to me is really big. I also don't think in this, in, tem- in, st- in tempos, in um, thoughts of tempos, it's more about just emotions. Right. So thinking about taking the audience on a journey um, is, is what I do. And I try to, I try to afterwards when kids do that, like, was your favorite piece this piece or that piece or this piece they have the concert reflection whatever you know if, if i have a piece that we played that literally nobody thought was their favorite piece i usually won't do that piece again you know and i'm usually pretty good it's usually pretty evenly split throughout the pieces mm-hmm. no that's awesome but you know, also I, I, also letting the kids grow like not under programming sorry to keep going but not under programming no. but 
like giving them stuff to strive for, but also not over programming. Like if we went and try to play grade sixes right now, like we would not sound very good. Right. So it's, I also think band directors need to play more grade two, like high school band directors. There's so much grade two out there. That's really good music. You know, I'm working on with one of my groups right now, um, themes from first suite. It's by the legendary Michael Sweeney, but it is basically the first and third movements of first suite by Holst, but like at the grade two level, and half the time it sounds like the original piece, like it is, the, but it's totally playable. And if you want to work on first suite and all the great stuff that's in there, at least the first and the third movements, but you can't necessarily have the time to work on that or they're not ready. Pieces like that are just amazing. But people might go, oh, that's a middle school piece. We're not going to touch that. It's like, no, you can get great music out of it. So don't limit yourself. I'm so glad to hear you say this, considering I live in the, the world of overprogrammed band. Uh, we, we were... Several years ago, we were honor man finalists and we were sitting there listening and, and in Texas, there's a statewide competition for a concert band. Uh, and the finals are, the recordings are played in an open session. So anybody can sit there and listen to the whole thing. And so the other director and I were sitting there listening and our kids did great. We were super proud of them. We knew we were gonna win, but this was at a, this is a, a, a seventh and eighth grade ensemble. And then I, I hear the, the nice little intro from clarinets of Molly on the Shore from seventh and eighth grade ensemble. And they were very accurate. It was very clean, but I was just like, really? They're eighth graders. Like, do you really need to, how much time do you have to spend spoon feeding and starting it at like 30 to clean that clarinet intro up so it's that clean, right? How much extra time, how much extra money did you spend on that? That they could have perhaps been in a situation where they'd have a little bit more of their own their own ownership of mm -hmm. the experience and it would gel more with them. You know, um, I had a friend who did, um, it's another junior high director, but he did Concord a few years ago and he didn't rehearse it at all. He was just like, I'm going to let y'all pick a piece. We're going to listen to it. We're going to do it together. Then y'all are going to have to come up with the lesson plans. And then some of y'all are going to have to come up and rehearse and listen, and we're going to record and y'all have to do the lesson plan for the next day. And I'm not going to be the teacher for this one piece. I'll do the, the other pieces you're going to have to be the ones to decide this. And I was like, man, I wish I had been this smart enough to think about that. Cause that's a really wow. cool idea. <laughs> did he have them conduct it, rehearse it and all that? And he, or did he conduct it and let them just. So, so, so he ended up, I'm not sure what happened on the final, uh, on the final concert. I'll have to ask him next time I see him. Um, I know in the rehearsals that, that he would have a student come up and they would rotate which student would come up and be on the podium and, and doing that with him up there to kind of help out, you know, and using a metronome, you know, somewhat regularly to help out mm -hmm. with that too. And if you're using a metronome, why are you conducting? It's another thing. If people be like, I love metronomes, but you know, like, like all, like a chainsaw, I'm not going to use it to hang pictures in my house. My wife would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, there, there's a time and a place for the metronome. And I think people, I think a lot of bands who don't use it should use it. But there's also probably a lot of bands who use it too much. And here's the cool thing I stole from some jazzers at North Texas. Mix up what the metronome stands for and you really see how well people are paying attention. Hey, this metronome is the measure now. Hey, this is the half note. So it's half of the measure in 4-4. Figure it out. And I went, oh, yeah, that would really stretch my students. <laughs> and, you know, one of the best things for the metronome for me, and I don't typically use metronome in my big band. But if you've got that drummer, if neither the drummer or the bass player are really rock solid, like if the tune's supposed to be 172, which sounds fast, but in big band, that's not fast, right? And they're, they're just sinking and sinking. You're like, you can't, it doesn't do anything. Like you can say you're not fast enough. You can say all the things, but like literally going duck, 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 like that tells them everything they need to know. So I think people need to like use it when it will help you. But yeah, it's not a substitute for music making. Along those lines, you know, I'm curious, do you use the Harmony Director or Tonal Energy or anything like that? You know, I would love to. I don't have one. You need I do to use... get Tonal do... Energy. It's like $3 and you can, Yamaha will be upset with me. They, they've they been upset with me before because I've done a fair amount of work with them and I love them. They're great. But you can spend $50 on the on a keyboard like ten dollars on a wire to your phone and three dollars on the tonal energy app and you can do about 75 percent of what the harmony director can do okay 
I love it. I love a good drone, you know, a good, I, I was just doing a trombones and euphonium sectional today and they're young kids and you're like not having the fixed pitch and all that. And even me, as I play trombone, like, you know, I'm a professional brass player, but I don't know exactly where fourth is. Like I'd have to play with other players, you know, like, yeah, I, I think it's I weird do. to tune, right? Yeah. Fourth I, doesn't I think have I a do. geographic place. <laughs> so like, <laughs> But then like putting it on the church organ sound or the string sound and actually having the drone as they play through, like the kids got so much better. Like if I didn't have that ability. So I, I do do a lot of that fixed pitch stuff, but I, I haven't used either one of those. But I will. Uh, I'll check that out. I think it's definitely for any listeners out there. If you go hey, one of the things you hear when you hear the Japanese bands and you're like, oh, my gosh, this is one of the things is they spend a lot of time on matching to a reference pitch that is locked into the key right that's what the harmony director originally was its thing you set the key and then it would adjust you know for the harmonic series for that key but you it's not just about putting on an f and matching everything like you can do it to individual notes you can mm -hmm. it really where it's really a great ear training thing it's something that i was never really good at of course when it's same thing when we started teaching harmony directors weren't a thing right um, mm -hmm. but it's something that since, since I've had a chance to kind of do a deep dive with a few colleagues, it's like, you can get, you can get some really serious mileage out of not a whole lot of time on this. And it can be done without paying the $600, which is still better than the $1,500 that it, or 13 that it used to be. Yeah. But, you know, if I can do it for under a hundred, that's a whole lot better enough in, in many situations of which I've worked. <laughs> I love it. Hey, so, so you're a woodwind player. I am. Great. Um, no one's perfect, but it's okay. I, well, I know, but that's okay. I forgive you. <laughs> um, so tell us about the clinic. I know you want people to go to it, but right. Give well, us a... they, they gave me a Friday afternoon time. This is not my first time to have a Friday afternoon Midwest time. So we're going to work with whoever's there. <laughs> yep. But um, I'm actually pretty excited about it because we're just going to go through and we're going to hit the, the, the greatest hits of beginning woodwinds, and then we're going to set up embouchures. So I'm going to be bringing in mouthpieces, reeds. We're going to take whoever's there. We're going to take volunteers. We're going to put the camera on the screen, and we're going to go through actually how do you set up the first embouchure to set mm -hmm. them up for success. So it'll be things like how do we make the embouchures? What's a lesson plan that we can use, you know, a sequence that we can use to actually get this successful? It's not the only sequence, just the sequence that I tend to, to favor. Um, but it is one that has had success. Um, and and talking about you know, what do you need to know about articulation? What do you need to know about playing position? What are the, 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 the five or six key things for every instrument that if you can get these right, it's going to set those woodwind students up for success from the get-go. So just to give an example of what I'm talking about, clarinet, clarinet, okay? You've got to have your corner set. I call this the crescent from corner to corner across the bottom lip drawing that sheet flat, but you've also got to have the right teeth placement, the right mouthpiece placement, and the right tongue position. And if you mm -hmm. do all of those with a mouthpiece and barrel, you'll get an F sharp that's somewhere between 10 and 35 cents sharp. That's a very good place to be. If it's too high, you've squeezed too much with your jaw. If it's too low, you've dropped your tongue or you've dropped your jaw. And those matter for the break. Break is not actually hard to do on clarinet. The problem that people get with break on clarinet is they don't get the prerequisite skills which is proper embouchure, proper tongue placement, proper tilting of the left hand to be able to use the side of the, the first finger to touch the A key and moving all four of these fingers in the exact sequence. If you do all of that, then the break is do these fingers now and then they do it. Hmm. It's way oversold as being hard, but it's hard because if you skip any of those prerequisites, then it becomes really hard because those skills have to be in place before you do it. So those are the kind of things that, that we're going to be talking about of like, okay, what are the, the crucial things that you've got to do this if you want them to have success from the get-go? So I, I was actually really pretty pumped when, when it got accepted just because I know this is something that took me a long time to put this together where I feel pretty good about this. Like I'm 20, 19 years in and I'm like, you know what? I think I could kind of set up a clarinet I'm sure now. Mm -hmm. with some consistency but i would love to help people not have to wait that long because it took me a while to get there yeah you know and setting up beginners whether it doesn't matter what it is setting up beginners well pays dividends in the long run and people think well i don't teach beginners so i don't need to like hello like any kid you have first of all you could get new kids in plus you go to somewhere where you need to fix stuff you you need to know the beginner stuff 
before they i mean how often do we get a clarinet section that can play molly on the shore like the first day of school right it doesn't it doesn't happen you need to be able to know all those beginner things as an even if you teach high school well i mean how often do you sit in front of a you know a, let's say a non-varsity group and and you hear some clarinet sounds and you're like wow that's really out of tune well knowing what goes on here and knowing what note to tune to hint the most stable note is not concert f on the clarinet mm -hmm. <laughs> that that makes a difference and you stuff you can quickly apply even to your high school setting that will make a difference and if you know the instruments you know then you know what to what to do to fix on that i i'm the worst trumpet player known to man mm -hmm. <laughs> okay i'm absolutely terrible at it but i took trumpet lessons for a while and i've taken it from a couple different people because even though i myself really struggle even when i'm practicing really hard to be good at trumpet I needed to know what those people knew because I had trumpets in my band. Love it. You know, it's like, I don't know. It's a, it's a bit of a rant, but because, because I feel so strongly about this, like we're responsible for all the instruments in our ensemble. Those kids there, they want to learn how to play. Where are they going to get that information? If not us. That's right. You know, so anyway, I will let that I will let that go. That's my little that's my little preaching to the choir moment. I love but, it. It's great. You know, I, I I just lost. I had something I was going to follow up with, and I just lost. See, I need to steal your your tip of, of taking notes. <laughs> Having notes. <laughs> We've gone through most of my notes, to be honest with you. <laughs> so I do have one thing that I always like to get from anybody I talk to. Uh, because like I said, I spend the majority of my time, whether it's writing books or doing clinics or working with grad, uh, undergraduate students, helping people get into their first couple of years and not just crash and burn. That's my, that's my professional space. So I always love to get experienced teachers thoughts on this idea. So if you had a room of, let's say a thousand first year teachers or 2000 first year teachers, which is, you know, 2000 is actually pretty close to what my half of the podcast listeners are like every month mm -hmm. um and you could you had you had next 15 20 minutes to tell them anything that you wanted to to help them out in their beginning part of their career what would you tell them wow totally unplanned um <laughs> see, and see if i can remember both of them um number one i would say you have to be willing to work hard I think there's a lot of people who are not super willing to work hard they want to go into a thing and have it kind of fit their lifestyle. And I mean, that might happen for some people, but I mean, I had to work really hard to get my band to sound good. You know, I had to spend the time. I listen to music at home. I do emails at home. Like I know you're not supposed to do that now, especially after COVID it's like, have your own space. And I, I get that that's important for people, but especially when you're young, like work hard, like be willing to work. Um, cause obviously once you get kids or get married or other things, like it's harder to, to do that. So um that's number one number two i would say you mentioned a book and i want to hear about your book actually i haven't read it but once i met you i'm like i gotta read that book i didn't get it in in time but i would have people understand that you know the older you are the more you realize you don't know stuff you know like i get i remember standing in front of my first band the first day i'm like i know everything and i clearly did not and uh just to people to understand that you're gonna grow you're gonna get better as you do this um don't beat yourself up be willing to work and uh you know know that you don't know everything but i also have people read the the john wooden book named wooden it's just like a treasure trove of working with people like there's a classic example of um john wooden and he was talking to a famous basketball player i forget the basketball player it might have been kareem abdul jabbar anywhere anyway um and somebody said how are you going to deal with kareem i might have the story wrong but like this famous player and he said how are you how are you going to deal with him and, and what he brings and he said, well, you don't deal with people like you work with people, you know, and he just had this way of like putting everything into perspective, like the, the UCLA teams would win the championship 13 years in a row, right, or whatever it was, literally the first day of practice in September, he's teaching them how to put their socks on. Like, this is how you properly put on socks, because if you don't, you'll get a wrinkle, which will mean a blister, which means then you can't play or you're not going to be as effective. So there's so many life lessons in teaching that are in that book that's just self-titled wooden um, that I would have people read as well. well. That's fantastic. I'm going to have to add it to my uh, to read list. And it's an easy read. Like I suck at reading, but it's like, it's <laughs> super easy reading, super easy. You know, I mean, one of the things, one of the things that you just said, right? The, the, 
the more we know, the more we realize how little we know. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, there's always why, why we still go to things and we still talk to people and why you're doing this, right? Cause you learn mm-hmm. things from every time we talk. At least I do. Every time Absolutely. I talk to somebody, I got new things to add to my, my little treasure trove of, Ooh, this will make me a better teacher. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Just sharing what we know with other people and then yeah. learning from people as we do it. It's funny. I'll, I'll meet with somebody who's like, you consider a superstar. Like they have like the best band in the country at this or close to it. And they're like, yep, it's working with kids. I didn't have a fourth trombone at the beginning of this year, but I worked with a kid and got him up there. And you know, it's like, we all do the same thing. Now, you know, if your high school has 6,000 people and your band's got 400, well, that's fine. But my high school has 600 and I've got 82, you know, it's like, that's pretty good. You know, you kind of look mm-hmm. around and you're like the people I truly admire are those people with 300 in the high school and 270 are in band. Like to me that those are the people I need to go hang with. Yeah. I used to, uh, he didn't work with him in the sense that we were in the same district, but he was in the neighboring town over um, like 800 students uh, at the school. 630 in band wow. and i was just always like dude <laughs> you know percentage wise like i, I was proud know. when we got to 50 percent of one grade mm-hmm. in band and i was like yes. hey this is pretty awesome that's awesome 50 percent of the sixth grade class is signed up for band i'm gonna i'm gonna do a little happy dance <laughs> so they he i mean 630 people like how many directors do they have uh well they had three they had three full time at the school, um, plus because this was at a middle school, uh, and then two the two of the high school directors would come down and help out for one or two periods. Yep. We have better staffing in Texas, <laughs> like just yep. for that. <laughs> Music is a required course in the elementary level, and uh, it is one of only a couple of required courses to meet uh, fine arts credit credit at the middle school level. Mm-hmm. So we have, we have some state funding support for it. That's just, it doesn't exist in a lot of places, I mm-hmm. get. Um, but at the same time, when you've got that many kids, like there's no way to do that by yourself. Like it's literally impossible. <laughs> yeah. And your band isn't better because it's bigger. Right. Like now it, don't get it, me wrong. Their band was phenomenal. Yeah. Like, you know, there, there was some amazing teaching going on at that school. So they had both big and better. I used to get so frustrated because sometimes administrators unrelated would be like, well, but why aren't you doing what they're doing at this school? And I'm just like, really, man? Really? Like, uh, we're we're rocking our 51% enrollment because it was at that same situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's pretty good. Uh, but you know, you just asked me how come we didn't have the same number of students participate in this, not percentage, but number. We're a smaller school with smaller programs. I don't know what to mm-hmm. tell you. The math doesn't work. <laughs> you know? Yeah. No, it's, you know, it's really cool. And it's what's so cool about all these different resources, the podcasts, the different books. You know, I'm definitely going to be checking out um, that that uh, uh, air detection book and and looking that up because i'm Mm -hmm. like ooh, that sounds like something i could really learn from and and improve on so i think that's really fantastic you know will you tell me and my listeners a little bit about your book absolutely uh so um, i'm not gonna lie i've been super excited about this book for a while it is though geared towards younger teachers more than it is to experienced ones um uh, the book's titled program notes a comprehensive guide to band directing and i tried to hit as much as possible so we have a bunch of stuff about the the underlying how does teaching and learning work then we have a bunch of stuff that's like, how do you travel with a group? There's a list of 150 pieces for young bands from grades one to four, mm-hmm. uh, as well as some marches. And like, if I were going to select this for an ensemble, what would be the things that I would be paying attention to in this piece? Right. So it's got the key, it's got the time signature, and then it's got notes right. about, you know, what 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 works with this piece, what doesn't. Very short. Okay. Um, I'm not knocking because this is also published by GAA. So say people who do teaching through performance, it also highlights which pieces are in teaching through performance. It's got a section on how do you run marching band and develop a style manual. It's got a section on you want to teach jazz. Okay, here's some stuff. Here's the, here's the, the basic things, those fundamental things that you need to know to be able to make your big band work well, mm-hmm. right? It's not chasing the weeds of, oh, I want to arrange or compose my own piece. This book is really for people who are saying, okay, I need some help. I don't feel, for whatever reason, prepared. Where can I get some information? 
Um, I did the concert band chapter, and one of the things I'm the most proud of in that is there's an entire table of what we call here at Texas State um, heuristics, which is the psychological term for basically checklists for problem solving. Oh, my clarinets are squeaking. Here are the seven reasons that may cause that, right? Mm -hmm. So I put one of those together for, from the podium for the whole ensemble. My ensemble is dragging. My ensemble is rushing. The, the vertical alignment doesn't exist the way I want it to. Okay, what could be causing that? What are some strategies from the podium, like we talked about with bopping with subdivision? What are some things I can do to fix it right then and there? Put together like a four, five, six page. I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to look at it. It's actually right over there. Um, just list of those, just one after another. Okay, my I, I can't get my balance fixed. Okay, well, it could be caused by these things. Try this stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's an entire book of, of, of largely stuff like that that has the foundational things like teaching, learning, how do I get a job? How do I make nice with the people I need to make nice with and who are they? Because mm -hmm. if nobody's told you to make friends with your janitor, make friends with your janitor. <laughs> Mm -hmm. or whoever handles your facilities, right? Stuff like that. So it's got all that stuff. It's got a whole bunch of rehearsal teaching stuff. And then it's got a whole bunch of administrative stuff. Because I feel like, you know, that's hard. If when, when, you know, the first time you ever travel with a high school, that's not easy. And you got to make sure the kids are safe, right? And so tips about all of that, tips about interacting with boosters, um, uh, like Permission slips, it's got example of permission slips, example objective sheets, example, like, you know. So I tried to cover all the stuff that I thought if I were to go back to 22-year-old to me and say, what did I need to know so that I didn't just flail around for years mm -hmm. and put it into a book? So it's been an exciting project. So, uh, you know, if I talk too long, feel free to chop some of that out, but no, I've that, been that really great. enjoying it. <laughs> That's great. I'm going to I'm gonna buy it. When did it come out? Uh, 2022. So it's only been out about 18 months. Right on. Um, so and it's it's from GIA uh, publications. Um, and I do have to shout out and just say Alec and, and all of them have just been wonderful. They're just such wonderful people. And I was just so grateful that they they saw some merit in this and they let me keep some really random stuff in there. Like there's one of the only chapters on if you want to learn how to teach mariachi and you don't know anything about it, it's there now. Probably not a huge thing for you in Maine, but I can tell you in the Southwest, <laughs> that's a big thing, <laughs> right? Um, so, you know, they, we were able to keep some, some stuff in there, like, um, like the, the, the repertoire list that kind of, sometimes when I talk to people, they're like, well, is that, would people really want that? That seems kind of random. Um, and they were willing to work with me. So it's, it's been very cool. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to the Growing Band Director.